yeah, welcome, Olivia. Cool, thanks. So I'm assuming my screen is up. Yep. Um, the, my PowerPoint, cool. So I'm on my iPad, so it's a little bit temperamental, but we should be able to get there. So um, yeah, hi, I'm Olivia. I'm a PhD student, I'm in my second year. And I've picked to talk about this paper published last year um, called about M2 macrophage derived exosomes uh, promote cell migration and invasion in colon cancer. And so I'll just mention a little bit about my research and why I picked this paper. So my first year work was on 3D cell culture models. We worked with colorectal cancer and I did some targeted DNA sequencing of um, early onset colorectal cancer patients um, looking at the genetic profile of their tumor samples. And so I'm just starting my sort of new project, the main part of my PhD, which is immunomodulation. So that's investigating the immunomodulatory role of colorectal cancer derived EVs on macrophages and dendritic cells. So that's the cells within the tumor microenvironment. And some experiments I'm um, planning on doing a co-culture um, of the immune cells with colorectal cells and application of the EVs onto the immune cells and looking at polarization and inflammatory states. And so this is like quite new to me. So all this EV stuff was new to me starting my PhD. So I'm really trying to learn more about the cell-cell interactions within the tumor microenvironment. So I picked this paper, um, I had a quick read of it, and at the very end it said that we this paper looks at the role of macrophage EVs on colorectal cancer cells, but not colorectal cancer cell EVs on macrophages, which is what I'm gonna be doing. So it's sort of the opposite. So it gave me a really nice insight into something that um, I didn't really know very much about. So I'll get started. Um, and the way that I have sort of um, planned on doing this presentation is just that I've got all the figures, so I'll do a background and then I've got like figure one, figure two, and I'll present um, my interpretation of it and then we can just have like a discussion so that it's sort of fresh in my mind and we can all sort of talk about one thing and then move on to the next few. So if you have questions, just yeah, yell out, or I'm not sure if I can see the chat, but um, we can just discuss it after each figure. So the background of this paper is around tumor associated macrophages, which are important in tumor progression. And these are cells within the tumor microenvironment. And they've been shown to promote proliferation, invasion, and metastasis of tumor cells. And so macrophages can be polarized into M1 or M2 phenotypes. And this is sort of based around like their anti and pro inflammatory like cytokines that they release. And this is not very well characterized. So there's a lot of work done on these two polarization states, but it's not exact. So you don't necessarily have all of one phenotype. You can have a mix and sometimes it's not that clear cut. So that's sort of something to keep in mind. And the aim that I took from this paper is that they um, aim to determine whether these, the macrophage derived exosomes promote colon cancer cell metastasis and they explored the molecular mechanism or one of the molecular me mechanisms by which this occurred. And so first off, um, I just thought I'd just say about their method. So they use M2 macrophages isolated from colorectal tissue. So these are primary cells, but um, I don't know if you've like had a look into this, but it's kind of confusing about their methods about I think what they did is that they got the M2 macrophages from the primary like cancer tissue and then they stimulated them with um, stimulating media into this M2 phenotype. And that's like a little bit um, unclear, but that's what I got that they did. And they also used um, sorry, colon cancer cell lines. So they used SW48, which is a stage three. So the cells have met, like metastasized to the lymph nodes um, and SW480 is stage two and these CO115 cells, which I'll talk about a little bit further on, which um, are P10, which is a tumor suppressor mutant. Cool, so figure one, this first figure, so I've split it into the two experiments that they did. So they cultured these macrophages from clinical samples and they applied the media onto the SW48 cells. And so they've done some um, immunofluorescence to confirm the presence of macrophages using macrophage markers. 
And they've done this scratch test, which is a test that um, sees like the, it's like a wound healing distance. So the cells, you scratch and the cells move in and it sort of shows how fast they're migrating inwards. And they showed that, if you can see um, with the, this is the culture media treated cells that they um, travel a lot further. So they obviously have more migrating potential than just the cells with um, normal media. And I'd just say that they mentioned that their media is just DMEM with, without FBS. So all their media for their control is just serum-free media, which makes things a little bit easier. And then they did these two assays. So they have like the transport assays and I think here migration and invasion. And I think the difference between the two, so basically you like have the cells seated and on top of in an insert and the cells over time migrate um, downwards into like the matrix and in the invasion one they said they added like an extra layer of matrigel so those cells can really invade into it and then you fix and stain the cells and see how many have migrated and they've quantified this and shown that the cells treated with the media from the M2 macrophages um, more cells are migrating and invading. And now they've gone to the exosome. So I've talked about the EV isolation. So this is from the M2 macrophage media, and they said differential ultracentrifugation. So 12,000 times G for 30 minutes and 140,000 times G for 80 minutes. They did that twice. So firstly, they used the term exosomes, and I'm aware that's not necessarily um, the most perfect term to use. So I guess what they're doing is they're just looking at small EVs. So I'm going to use the term exosome as they do in the paper, but I guess what they're characterizing is small EVs. And they do here, this is from the supplementary, this kit here, this is the first sort of, I don't want to say red flag, but thing that I noticed is in their methods, they say that they use either this differential ultracentrifugation or this total exosome isolation reagent, which I'm not familiar with. So maybe it's some kind of precipitation kit, but it's really unclear what, why they use different methods and which experiments they use the different methods for. So we're kind of left a little bit in the dark with that. So I'm not quite sure about like which one they used, but they did isolate their um, exosomes and they did the Western blot with their markers. And so the experiments they did is just the same as above with the um, so first they've just shown that the exosomes are present here in the, micro, in the um, cytoplasm of the cells and that the, the cells are positive with the um, exosome treatment. And then they did the scratch assay and they showed the same thing that relative to control, the cells that have been treated um, migrate like faster, I guess. And they also, um, more cells are migrating and invading here. But what's first off interesting is that this is culture media treated and this is exosome treated. And then they did culture media depleted of exosomes and the most, like the cells with the most significant increase in like migration and invasion are the culture media cells. And they don't really talk about that. So obviously there are factors in the media other than the exosomes that are promoting this sort of metastatic phenotype. So they don't really mention anything about that. Um, so their, I guess, first conclusion was that the macrophage-derived exosomes enhance mm -hmm. colorectal cancer cell mobility, migration and invasion. And for me, um, I did a little bit of this kind of stuff in my honors. And like for me, mo like mobility and motility, it would be something I would do maybe for this, it would be to look at like this, the polarization of the cells, sustaining maybe the actin or the cell cytoskeleton and seeing if there's actually a change in the actual cell cytoskeleton so that it's more polarized towards a metastatic phenotype. So that would be something extra that I'd be interested to see in. So that's um, all I got for the first figure. So people can yell out if they have anything to comment on. <laughs> Yeah, they could have used other markers. I mean, sorry, M2 is my area. Um, yeah. And, and with microglia macrophages, and it's a tool like receptor 7 actually does the, the switch from the phenotypes from one, M1 to M2. Yeah. 
And for instance, the, um, we could have used INOS for the M1 and also for M2, you could have Arginase 1 plus CD68 mm -hmm. and then gone and done additional markers to try and tease out would be TNF alpha and CD1632 for M1. Yeah. And you could do an M2 as well to tease out more using the mannose receptor and IGF1. So they could, yeah. have, they could have, they've done a very basic markers system. Yeah. And, and, I, and I totally agree that there are multiple in the M2 and there are multiple in the M1 and everybody's, you know, it's up in the air. Um, Moira, I just have a question for you then. Um, this is Morgan speaking from Kirsty's lab. Um, they talk about isolating M2 macrophages and Olivia commented on this. Is that the correct way to talk about it? Because wouldn't you have to stimulate the macrophage to an M2 phase before you use them? And should they be commenting on how they've done that? Well, it would also be that yeah. they would kind of presume that they were M2 polarised because they're tumour associated macrophages. Okay, so they have which are usually more M2 like because they help the tumour. Okay. But they wouldn't necessarily, just because you took them from the tumour, they wouldn't yeah. necessarily be M2. Right. Yeah. yeah. The, the polarised is, is, is quite correct. I mean, if you note some. Uh, TLR7's got quite a quite a prolific sort of uh, uh, just papers out there in the cancer area regarding that. So if you just look at it, it's a very it's a great stimulus mm -hmm. if you want to evoke polarization. Okay, cool. But yeah. I mean, it's interesting that what I would want to see is what actually is the polarization in the tissue because if yes. Olivia is correct and they have in vitro polarized these after they were isolated. You know, were they have they reversed an M1 polarization or were they unpolarized macrophages or were they already M2s? Yeah, um, yeah, that's where it's really unclear. So we spent a wee while discussing this and it, it's yeah, not not particularly easy to, to figure out what they've done. And in, and in previous studies when they've isolated macrophages from tumor, there is more of a mixed um, population. Mm -hmm. Um, and there is things like, you know, association of M1, more like M1 phenotypes associated with better prognosis, et cetera. Mm. Yeah. And even when you look at their results there on that bottom graph, that's appalling. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, you know, when you look at the figures, the, um, I know the graphs are quantifying and we're just looking at one view in the figures, but when you look at the exosome, uh, the M2 exosome uh, invasion, at least, it actually looks less than the conditioned medium. Yeah, that's yeah, that's something that I've sort of thought is that they not really like talked about that at all. They haven't said anything about other things in the media that actually, you know, other than the exosomes, they sort of. I'm not quite sure why they included it if they're not if they're just yeah. not going to include it, like talk about it. I mean, so. It's yeah. good to include it though, because a lot of groups won't. A lot of groups just go, vesicles do everything. I think it's actually quite nice and honest that they've got those as controls, mm. even though there's obviously some non vesicle secreted factor that's doing a lot of the work. Yeah. But, well, I think it would be, but I think it's realistic to assume that not everything's going to be the vesicles and there's often going to be combined effects. So I agree with you, okay. Shuri, that it's good that they, they, they show it. <laughs> How dare you? Vesicles do everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, all right, I might move on to the next figure. So figure two is now where they moved to in vivo studies. So they now wanted to see if they could see a similar thing um, in vivo. And so they treated the SW48 cells with either culture media or the exosomes and injected them into mice every three days and then did the bioluminescence imaging which is where the cells is um they come up really bright and they were injected into the caudal veins i think and my assumption is that that somehow gets into the lungs which is a really common metastatic site so that's why i think they focused on lung metastases but you can see sort of similar results as um like what they saw before is that the coach the mice treated with the um, culture media treated cells have 
these really large tumors forming and there's still um, some forming with the exosome treated ones and the overall survival is pretty similar for them both. And then here in C, they're looking at the number of nodules and this is like initially a little bit unclear what because you think oh control that's a metastasis that's larger but I think what we sort of thought was like that that's a lot darker in these ones so they're looking at the number of nodules but that's not that clear either so this is sort of what the H and E stain I think they've based that on is that you can see that the purple the dark purple is the um, lung metastases and so there's again a lot more than the control in the culture media treated um, mice and then the exosome treated mice as well. And then they've just done this immunofluorescence here with the labeled EVs just to um, show uptake in the lung tissue. So this was pretty simple and they showed that exosomes isolated from, well here they said, yeah, the 163 positive macrophages is what they wrote in the paper. Um, not sure why it's M2, not M2 now, um, promote colon cancer cell invasion and migration in vivo. So that's all I've got to Olivia, that's probably a reviewer who's asked them not to call them M2 based on everything yeah. that we were talking about before. But, yeah, but now it's in that one sentence where they conclude their sort of results, it's now 163 positive, not M2, like it is in the rest of the paper. So <laughs> to me, it's not very consistent. Yeah. Cool. All right, I can move on to figure three. So this here is now where they wanted to, they know that the um, exosomes are promoting these, this metastatic phenotype. And so they wanted to look at, I guess, the molecular mechanisms or see if there's any microRNAs um, involved in this. So they did, they did RNA seq screening and they identified microRNAs um, are regulated in M2 exosomes in the SW48 cells treated with exosomes and then they um, found six that they decided to look at and there were three with altered expression between control and M2 treatment and three that were the highest expressed in the M2 exosomes and that's these six here. And then so they did an RTQ PCR and no mention of housekeepers, control, normalizing, don't know any of that. Um, so I guess we just had to take their <laughs> word for it, but these two um, microRNAs were the ones that they found were upregulated with the M2 exosome treatment. So that's microRNA 21 and 155. Yeah, they're, they would be expected to because they're involved with inflammatory processes. Yeah, yeah. So these microRNAs are like quite, there's quite a lot of evidence um, that they yeah, promote tumor development and even some in colorectal cancer. So that's good that they found those ones. So they then just confirmed this with the microRNA um, Psi3 labeling. And then they wanted to see the effect of um, inhibiting these microRNAs on the um, cell migration and invasion. So here they did these five groups and I just point out, I think there's a mistake in the paper somewhere because the last group is a combination of them both but I think it says I can't remember where it says but it, it says the wrong thing in there so that's what the five groups are and so they treated the cells with just like a negative inhibitory control here and there's a lot more cells than the control that are migrating and invading and they've quantified it down hang on sorry my point is not, oh yeah down here and then when you inhibit um, MER21 or MER155, the number of cells um, that are migrating and invading like decreases. And so they've shown a similar thing when they do the same bioluminescence imaging in the mice that just the cells with the microRNAs are forming these larger tumors. And the same again in the um, lung histology, the number of nodules. Oh, that one's gone. So inhibition of MER21 and MER155 decreased the migratory invasive capabilities of the M2 treated cells. And so they stated that the macrophage derived exosomes regulation of colorectal, cal colorectal cancer cells migration and invasion depends on microRNAs. And this is like um, 
a sort of pet peeve that I've had with this paper is that they said in their colorectal cancer, the moment they're only looking at colon cancer, so it should just be colon cancer because they haven't included any um, rectal cancer cells or in here. So, yeah, so that's my um, interpretation of figure three. Um, just a question. I'm presuming that they, they normalize the dose of the M2, M2 exos um, by what protein amount or particle number or yeah i'm not i'm not sure about that one oh, yeah. um is that, is that that yeah that's a good point actually that's something that i should have thought out because that's really related to my project um but yeah. yeah i don't i don't think they talk about how they normalized it and then um uh, and i presume some way they've shown that the inhibition in this donor cell actually works yeah, this is this. Well, they've done this here. Oh, yeah. This was from yeah. the supplementary that I put in. So, oh, cool. yeah, they have validated that <laughs> works. So, yeah. Um, um, also, just on that point, Olivia, um, because they show that the inhibition works in the cell, but if we're looking at the exosomes, do you think that, or do you, this is open to the group, do you think it's important to look at the exosomes not containing um, those um, MERS? Um, yeah, well, I mean, it could be, but I think that the assumption if you knock it out in the cells, then the mm. exosomes won't be producing any, I think. That's okay. like, but I, enough, but I'm not entirely sure. I mean, can someone else comment on what they think? I mean, I think it's nice to see a decrease in the EBs as well, yeah. but I'm not sure that it's like the kind of thing that I would nitpick on too yeah. bad. Yeah, oh. yeah. Cool. All right, so hang on, okay, figure four, and one of my pink things has come up on there. Um, so this was like probably my favorite figure. So this here was um, looking at like a potential target that these microRNAs um, are acting on in the colorectal cancer cells. So they looked at 12 genes um, related to cancer cell metastasis. And so then they treated um, the cells with M2 exosomes and then did an RTQPCR of some um, genes that they um, have identified that are target genes. And so then they found that BRG1, um, the mRNA level is massively reduced with the treatment from the M2 exosome. So they have then looked at this particular protein. Um, and so here yeah, now my circles have come up. So in this graph here, they this is their first, this is a Western blot. And I've just circled these because these are the important ones. Um, I guess I've only really been looking at this first one as the control. And so they then are looking at the relative levels of the protein when they have a microRNA 21 um, or 155 mimic or when they inhibit the microRNA. So when they have the um, MER21 mimic, then you can kind of see there's a slight decrease. And when you inhibit MER21 here, it, the levels increase and you see a similar thing for 155 again. And then when you um, use both the MER21 and the MER155 mimic, the protein expression is really downregulated, and when you inhibit them, it's upregulated. And this here is just a quantification of this. And then they did a lucifrase assay. So this is to look at um, binding partners. So when there's no binding partner to the, but when there's no binding to the three prime UTR site, then you see no activity. But when um, a binding partner binding partner is present, then the luciferase activity goes down. So they've used this BRG1 three prime mutant. So obviously the microRNAs can't bind to this. Um, and this is the control. And then when you add in the um, MER21 mimic, the activity goes down. So the MER21 is binding to the three prime UTR site. And then when you have the mutant, um, there's no change in activity. So obviously the MER21 is binding to that site and they've done the same um, in MER155 and shown similar 
results. And then what they've done here is done the opposite. So they've used an inhibitory, um, what's it called, when in the vector, they've inhibited the um, MER21. So here with just the um, wild type 3' UTR and you inhibit MER21, the, num the activity um, decreases. So this is probably because there's some already um, like endogenous MER21 that's having an effect in the cells, but then so when you knock it out, then there's a lot less um, activity. And then when you have the mutant, this inhibitor doesn't have an effect. And the same with the um, MER155. So the MER21 and MER155 bind to the BRG1 3' UTR, and there's no binding activity with the 3' UTR mutant. So I think that they've done like a pretty good job of showing us that BRG1 is the target of MER21 and MER155. So that's figure four, um, if anyone has any comments. So um, that luciferase I say is a, that difference is pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Spent yeah. a lot of time doing those, a lot of my time, and I never got a good difference like that. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, I, mean, I, I was just I was just thinking the same thing. They look very nice. <laughs> yeah. Pretty picture. <laughs> cool. All right, I can move on to the next one. Um, so now is where they sort of put the two together. So they know that. So we figured out that the um, M two exosomes have these. Um, MER21 and 155 and they're being transported to the colorectal cancer cells and they're acting on this BRG1 protein which promotes migration invasion so they wanted to kind of put that all together and so here for some reason I'm very confused about why they brought in this SW480 cells here and they sort of bring it in and bring it out again and it's not clear why they use one particular cell line over the other so you kind of only see it um, every so often, but what they've done is just shown that treatment um, with the M2 exosomes down regulates this BRG1 protein. And they have then do um, a Western blot with the treatment with M2 exosomes and the microRNA inhibitors. So with the just exosome treatment, this um, BRG1 protein is completely like downregulated. There's nothing, but then when you and when you have um, an inhibitor, it's upregulated. And when you have the um, treatment with the exosomes and the microRNA inhibitor, it's still downregulated. So the downregulation of the BRG1 expression can be kind of rescued by microRNA inhibitors. And I've shown the same thing with MER155. And then when you have yeah, the M2 exosomes and the two inhibitors, you sort of have a kind of not too much change in the um, protein levels. And then they've looked at, this is in um, immunohistochemistry, I think, um, staying where the brown protein is for positive cells, so cells that are expressing the protein, and they've done the control and then treatment with, here they've brought back the M2 culture media and the M2 exosomes and shown that the protein is downregulated um, with this treatment. And then they've done this luciferase assay, which looks at the, so they have the BRG1, the mutant binding sites, I think. So this, here's where they've included um, the mutant where the MER21 can't bind and then where the 155 can't bind and then when both can't bind. So they've done the same thing. They've treated the um, cells with the M2 exosomes and shown that there's decreased luciferase activity. But then when you have the MER21 mutant, so the MER21 can't bind, then you have no change from the control. So there's no um, binding activity. And then the same with the 155 and same again with both of them binding. So the M2 exosomes can reduce the luciferase activity, but 
only with the wild type, um, the three prime UTR sites. So if the microRNAs can't bind, then the um, M2 exosomes can't reduce the luciferase activity because there's nothing binding. And so the down, then they wanted to look at whether the down regulation of this BRG1 by the exosomes contributes to metastasis. So this is super confusing. They <laughs> looked at their figure legend and it like literally makes no sense. But I figured out that E is the SW48 cells and then F is the CO115 cells, which are a P10 mutant and this is a target of MER21. So these are also colon cancer cells, I think also stage two, and they just um, a target of MER21, so it's a mutant, so it doesn't have that, that target site. So in the SW48 cells, they've done, I uh, used the GFP vector and to overexpress the BRG1 protein to see if, um, over, what overexpression of the BRG1 does. So these four, like one, two, <laughs> three, four, match onto these four here. It's a little bit confusing. And then I think that these here is the migration assay. And then these ones here are the invasion assay with that extra bit of matrigel, I think is what my interpretation of it was. So they all kind of show a really similar thing that the control cells, there's like a certain number of cells that are migrating, invading, and then when you treat with the exosomes, there's a lot more. But then when you overexpress the um, BRG1 protein, this goes down. So it, this protein is acting, I guess, to prevent the um, metastatic phenotype of the cells. And then they've, yeah, so it shows a similar result for both of those assays. And it also shows similar for these. CO115 cells. So when you have exosomes and you overexpress the BRG1, there's a massive um, difference in the number of cells that are able to migrate and invade. So it's pretty clear that BRG1 is a major factor for this macrophage, macrophage derived exosome inducing cell migration and invasion. And so the conclusion for this figure was that the macrophage derived exosomes promoting colorectal cancer cells, migration and invasion is dependent on BRG1. So that's what I've put for that. Um, anyone have any comments about it? Cool. All right, now we're gonna get to the last figure, which is the most probably um, interesting one. <laughs> it's I think here what they've, you know, what they've done is they're linking it to like clinical, um, to patients. And I think when they talk about in their methods, they, cause they talked about the M2 macrophages being isolated by this protocol and the TAMs being isolated by this protocol. I think this is what they're using the TAMs for, the tumor associated macrophages because they did make a note to make them separate in their methods section. So what they wanted to do was just to see yeah, if there's any sort of clinical correlation between this BRG1 protein and um, say like a poorer prognosis or metastasis. So they analysed public gene expression profiles through the TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas, and these are like not great, but they've said that there's a significant negative correlation between BRG1 and CD163, which is the macrophage marker. And then there's a significant, but not really, um, correlation between FIP, which is a cancer-associated fibroblast marker, and then CD34 is a um, endothelial cell marker and there's a negative but not significant correlation between the two. So they've sort of said yes there's this significant um, correlation between like negative correlation between BRG1 and these um, M2 macrophages and so what they've done is to in a sense like confirm this is they've just looked at some other um, cell types and whether other cell types 
the exosomes or like the culture media can affect the BRG1 protein and they've seen, they say that the only one is the M2 um, culture media. But again, that's culture media, that's not exosomes. So that kind of, I mean, there's a lot, yeah, as I've said before, lots of other factors and things in the media that, that could be going on. So it's possible that the exosomes are from other cell lines are having an effect. And then um, they did. Olivia, the, yeah. so yeah. can I just ask you a question there? With that sequencing yeah. data, I'm presuming that's bulk tumor sequencing, is it? Um, for the. As for the, the from the public database, is that uh, is that looking at bulk tumor sequencing, and then looking um, at BRG1 and CD163 expression? They are. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Hang on, hold on. Sorry. Okay, I, I guess just what I'm getting at there is if they're correlating those two. I mean, what else expresses CD163? Because it wouldn't necessarily yeah. just be the. A speed Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a good point. They, yeah. They've said that we analyzed public gene expression profiles to find the relationship between BRG1 and specific markers of some of the non-tumorous cells in the tumor microenvironment. The association between BRG1 and CD163 FRP or CD34 expression was analyzed using this Pearson correlation test. Um, so I don't know, that's the answer. Yeah, it sounds like it will be. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Those, those negative correlations don't look very convincing. Yeah, I know that was what, the amplifiers yeah. are, are pushing it to be, you know. <laughs> no, but it's also it's also not going to be very specific trying to correlate those if you're there's going to be a lot of background with, you know, everything else, and also it's not going to be specific about what's actually expressing those. So I'm not surprised yeah. that the correlations don't look fantastic. But it would have been mm. nice for them to do a blinded, an, a correlation with any gene, B or G one, yeah. any gene, and then seeing what fall up, falls out. Yeah, that's a good point. Have a control, sort of. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah just... I mean, that's a much more statistically valid method, but it's least likely to give you something that's technically statistically significant, <laughs> even if it looks like that. <laughs> yeah. So, so I guess that's maybe why they didn't. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. And so the this here is the stuff is. I'm a little bit confused about why they did it because essentially what they're showing is that there's a correlation between metastasis and the CD163 macrophages and it's already very like well studied that the, that, you know, like CD163 or like M2 macrophages are associated with like a um, proprognosal metastasis. So first thing I'm going to point out here is that they don't have any patient demographics. All we know is they had 61 patients. And it was through some, because the paper I think is um, from China, they did mention some ethics that they followed, but it doesn't have a specific like approval for this paper. So I'm not sure how it works, but we don't know anything about the patients. So I think that these yeah, are just the um, macrophages that they've isolated earlier and they've stained them with the macrophage markers just to show that they're there essentially. And then, They've looked at these um, these like histology specimens and shown that cells with metastasis have got a higher level of CD63 than those without metastasis, and that the although they have shown that the BRG1 protein is um, regulated in the patients. So I say cells before I mean patients without um, metastasis, which is interesting. I guess that kind of does fit with what they've shown is that the exosomes are down like using these microRNAs to downregulate this protein so that they can promote metastasis. So you would expect that without metastasis you would have lower levels of this protein. And then they've done this um, chi-squared test on these patients and we don't know anything about the patients. So to put this these details here is a little bit um, pointless if we don't actually know how many patients were male, how many like were female, like and um, 
and oh, then they've like said that these so these one six three macrophages um don't like uh not associated with metastasis and these ones are but this is like not really relevant to the brg1 um, work that they've been doing and then they've shown here the disease free survival curves using some um what's the word? some oh, i've forgotten what the word is but um some like cert some oh, Algorithm, that's the word I'm looking for. And so they've said that they found that patients with more CD163 positive macrophages had reduced survival compared to patients with less CD163 macrophages. And so they say that these tumor associated macrophages are enriched and positively related to metastasis in colorectal cancer. So they've sort of tried to link this all together, but it's um, yeah, not like particularly clear about how they're really linking it all together with the correlations and to this BRG1 protein. So yeah, people can have some, you know, have any input about that. And I totally just realized that I said that we don't know how many patients are like male and female, but we do. So like these here are the numbers. I was wondering patients. about that. Sorry. Yeah, I said it and then I was like, hang on, actually like we, we do, we can see, so we can see that there's like 40 stage one and two patients and 19 stage three and four patients, but it would be nicer to have distinguished them, distinguish out those patients. But, yeah. um, do you find it, do you think Olivia that the reason why they have the correlations at the top is because the, the latter work they do at the bottom is just looking at the macrophages themselves and not looking at BRG1? So it's their attempt at So it's their attempt at linking the two, the yeah. protein of interest yeah. to, yeah. That's what I think they're, they're trying to do. So they are saying that there's a link between BRG1 and these um, macrophages and these macrophages are, you know, involved in metastasis. So they must sort of all link together. Yeah. So in F and G, uh, that, that's CD163. CD yeah. And yeah. And G looks GSE. That's a that's an array probe. That, that, yeah, that, I'm not sure about that. I thought that's something they've forgotten to take out. GSE one four three three. That'll be a um, geo um, array data set, and that's the probe name. That's an Affymetrics probe set. Yeah, it says survival analysis of two hundred twenty six. Now we're going to two hundred twenty six, not sixty one. Mm -hmm. Diagnosed patients with colorectal cancer based. Yeah. CD163 mRNA levels and GEO cohorts. Yep, so it's a published data set that they've used to validate the study, but, but um, oh, it's annoying. They changed the color. Yeah, yes. that's what was very tricky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, why would you do that? <laughs> okay. um, but I'm, I, yeah, I'm confused too. So why don't they just yeah. look at the BRG1 array probe in yeah. the data set as well? Yeah, I'm not sure that's confusing. Yeah. And yeah, I just find this a little bit sort of thrown together, like they had to do it last minute to yeah. get it published and sort of yeah. what can we get that that might link this together and that's sort of what they've put together compared to like the other figures which are so sort of logical and very in depth and detailed and then this is sort of thrown together. <laughs> It's, it's not uncommon to see a little bit of human data at the end of a molecular paper like this, though. Yeah, something to tie it in. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So I've just got a summary slide about what I thought. So they demonstrated that MER215P and MER1555P can be transferred from, by exosomes from macrophages to tumor cells. And they say this is probably enabling the tumor cells in the vessel cancer interface to migrate more aggressively. So I think that they like they did a really good job um, of showing the link between BRG1 and the two microRNAs. So their yeah, like their luciferase um, assays have really like a good evidence that this is where they bind. And then I think there's some evidence um, in vivo to in vivo in vitro to link that to the metastatic phenotype but yeah I've put here other factors in the media so like pro-inflammatory um, anti-inflammatory cytokines so that is something that they don't really 
mention, they just say, oh, there are cytokines involved in the sort of um, M2 phenotypes, but in the introduction, but they just fail to mention it. So it, it sounds like, yeah, they haven't actually considered that, um, especially including it in their data saying that there's a difference between the culture media and then just the exosomes they should at least have some explanation for what that is. And then, of course, that the M1, M2 phenotype is not completely clear cut. And then I was reading their discussion and I was a little bit unimpressed by their discussion because from what I have understood, like from what I get from this paper is that these may not be like an, a, a lab that looks at the extracellular vesicles. They say that they've done previous um, papers based around this BRG1 protein. So they say they've said that it like is involved in P53 and the WIMP pathway. So I think that they started with that idea and then they, they've done a good job of showing logically how they got to there. But I, I feel like that's where they focus and that's where their discussion definitely focuses is a lot in the possible molecular mechanisms of how this sort of BRG1 is being um, downregulated and what effect that's having on the the cancer cells, but then missing a lot about the interaction between them, or interaction between the macrophages and the tumor cells, which is what I would have thought this would be, um, would have been quite interesting to talk about. And they don't actually, in their discussion, they don't really talk much about like colorectal cancer. So they mention like ovarian cancer and breast cancer in terms of roles of these microRNAs. But I mean, there are like, have been studies that have shown that MER21 is upregulated in colorectal cancer and has roles in this. So it would have been nice to link it to that. And then the fact that they say colorectal, but they've only looked at colon cells. So rectal cancer, although it's part of the colorectal cancer, it's quite different to colon, to colon cancer. And there are a lot of um, rectal cancer cell lines that you can use. So it would have been nice if they'd included one of those to see if there's any difference in rectal cancers. And then, of course, they, at the end, they note that they're only looking at the macrophage exosomes onto colorectal cancer cells, not the colorectal cancer exosomes onto macrophages. And that's like where my project fits in. So that's why now I know a lot about how macrophages influence colorectal cancer cells. And now I'm going to go and look at how colorectal cancer cells can influence macrophages. So it was really useful for me to understand something different. And I've learned a lot about um, sort of cell communication and macrophages, which is something I struggle with. So yeah, that's um, everything I have to say. Does anyone have any last inputs? I agree. They should have looked at cytokines, especially with the yeah. media. It's, uh, that's their downfall there. Yeah, even mentioning it, like saying it's possible that these cytokines can have this effect and so mm -hmm. They just failed to mention it at all. Yeah, but yeah. cytokines are like 1980s and, you know, they're not micro <laughs> musicals. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <sorry. laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll go and take my 1980s away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you, Maura. I'm, I'm there with you. Um, yeah. Um, so when you do your, your uh, colorectal vesicles, are you going to be um, doing primary tissue cultures or? Um, I was initially, but... Yeah due to like difficulties with contamination and um, now even like a further, I guess, backlog because of the lockdown and everything, I'm probably not going to because we, are, yeah, like it's, they have a high rate of contamination, the, col the primary cells and we um, didn't have like a, another incubator and stuff. So it's sort of got put on hold and now I think it's been put on hold too far. And I have so much stuff to do with the, immunomodulation I'm just going to use the cell lines so but that was something that I was planning on doing yeah yeah yeah, yeah Olivia's going to work on the cell lines if she has time <laughs> she might be some primary yeah <laughs> so. that COVID happened mm. yeah <laughs> and I hadn't yeah I hadn't thought about colorectal being a problem with contamination but of course it is Oh yeah. God, yes. <laughs> you can so you can and like you can wash them and wash them and wash them and like all of the different papers with protocols still fine. You just have to accept about a thirty percent contamination rate. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's a 
um, you pump it full of like antibiotics and it's a, what I've read is that it's a fine balance between not enough antibiotics and too much, like too many antibiotics. And so that's, you know, the cells aren't going to grow if there's too many there, but they'll get contaminated if there aren't enough. So it was starting off on my PhD. It was like quite a lot, but um, yeah, it's definitely would have been really interesting. Did the in that paper mention anything about active and E? About, sorry, active and E. No. <laughs> used by M2 microphages, and that's, um, mm. I'm just wondering if they they'd mentioned it. I don't think that they have. Okay. No. Yeah. Yeah, they definitely like focus more a lot on the regulation of the the protein, the BRG1. Um, but I guess that's, yeah, I mean, they've still done like a really good job with a lot of their studies. So, yeah, cool. So that's me. Thank you everyone for listening. And I actually finished on time rather than running late, which is something that I thought I'd do. So <laughs> That's very good. I enjoyed Thank it. You. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you so much for the presentation. I'll come. Do we come. have any other questions to Olivia or comments about the paper? Um, okay. Oh, yeah. Um, I never bother looking, but do we actually get the reference when, we're, when we get our appointment, diary appointment for the paper? Yeah, Anastasia, you normally send out the... Uh, yep, yep, yep. I include uh, the link, active link in the flyer, so you can click and get access to, to the paper. Okay, thanks. Oh, good. I will probably uh, be able to include or share actually paper in here, because with new updated uh, Zoom, I can share a file with everyone. So that's a good point. Thank you, Moira. Okay. I will be doing this. Any other comments or questions? Probably not. Thank you again, Olivia. That was a really interesting presentation. Thank you for detailed cool. analysis of this paper as well. That's cool. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Uh, just a reminder that we don't have a meeting next week, and we're going to meet again on 18th of uh, June. Hope to see you all then. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for joining.